Lately, I've found myself in a lot of conversations around NFTs, the blockchain, crypto, Web3, the metaverse. I have friends at Facebook and they're literally taking meetings in the metaverse. Wait, where's Mark? Those same friends are so excited to tell me about the newest NFT that they bought on the OpenSea. I even have family members talking to me about the newest tokens they've invested in. At Fifth Wall, our corporate partners are asking us all the time about what the impacts of Web3 will be on their real estate holdings. I'm really excited about the future of Web3, but I want to get to the bottom of which parts of this technology will have the biggest impact. So I want to ask a few of my colleagues at Fifth Wall what exactly Web3 is. Ariel, thank you so much for joining me. Yeah, happy to help. So Web3 is basically the new internet. To put it simply, you could think of it as community. Is that right? Yeah, that's exactly right. So you can think of it as the next iteration of the internet. So Web 3 suggests the existence of Web 1 and Web 2. What was Web 1 like? Web 1 was the original internet from around 1990s until 2005. It was sort of known as the read-only web interface. So you didn't really have user interaction and social media. It was the original version of the internet. Okay, so Web 1. What about Web 2? So Web 2 is known as the read-write web. So this started in around 2006, actually. This is where you saw the introduction of social media. So it was a progression in Web 2. 2006, that's when Facebook opened up to everyone and when YouTube started gaining a lot of popularity. Yeah, so at this point, YouTube gained a ton of momentum. There were higher internet speeds, there was greater global access to internet, so people were able to upload videos more easily. You also saw this move into the mobile as well. It's important to note that just like Web 1 and Web 2, data is still centralized, meaning entities and institutions are still controlling the storage and the sharing and the monetization of your data. Centralized institutions may sell access to you or to your newsfeed based on data that they gather and the type of ads that they think you'll click on. Right, and then the rise of Fang, or Facebook, Amazon, Apple, Netflix, and Google, and the large tech companies of the past 10 years. So when it comes to data and control over your data, Web3 is different. It's where it's decentralized, is that right? Exactly, it's decentralized and it's possible because of blockchain. So blockchain is the infrastructure that supports Web3. So blockchain is a shared definitive ledger and it allows for the process of recording transactions as well as tracking assets all through this platform. Is there a simpler way to explain it? Maybe with an example? Sure, so let's say I wanna give you this coin. The transaction generates a block representing the coin transfer. This block is transmitted to everyone in the network. The members of the network validate the transaction. The block is then added to the chain, which contains a permanent and visible record of the coin's transaction history. And then you're the owner of the coin. So the network of users monitoring the process is what makes it decentralized. Yeah, and it makes it more secure, transparent, efficient, and then you have the ability to automate future transactions. So I have blockchain, now crypto. Do they go hand in hand? Yeah, and, and a lot of cryptocurrencies have their own blockchain. Take Bitcoin, for instance. When it comes to crypto, you can think of it in three separate categories. So first, there are transactional cryptocurrencies. These are designed to be used as money and they're exchanged for goods and services. So these cryptocurrencies, like Bitcoin, they have their own native blockchain and basically they function as digital cash. Second, they're protocol coins. These are cryptographic tokens that are required to access the service that the underlying protocol provides. So to put it simply, these cryptocurrencies are essential to fueling the operations of a blockchain. Sort of like how gas is necessary to operate a vehicle. So take Ether for instance. In order to do any operation on Ethereum's blockchain, such as powering smart contracts, decentralized applications, and transactions, you will need Ether coins. All of the programs and services linked with Ethereum require computing power, and that power is not free. Ether is the solution to the issue of payment. So you can think of Ether as programmable money that through the Ethereum blockchain is able to define a smart contract. And through the smart contract, it's able to invest, transfer, and save itself once the conditions of the smart contract are executed. So if that can be applied to other contracts like property, that has huge potential for the real estate industry. Exactly. And so that's where we get into the third type of cryptocurrency, tokens. These have the potential to transform the world of real estate as we know it. So generally, any crypto asset can be referred to as a token, but I'm specifically referring to tokens that are built on top of other blockchains. So those that don't necessarily have a native blockchain the way that Bitcoin or the way that Ethereum do. I feel like you're about to say my favorite word, 
fungible. Alec, I'm so impressed. So at a basic level, non-fungible tokens are tokens that are built on a blockchain and they represent digital ownership of an asset. So real estate, music, videos, even a tweet can be turned into an NFT. The difference between an NFT and an Ether coin on the Ethereum blockchain is that the NFT is unique or non-fungible meaning it's not interchangeable like a coin would be for another coin. Also, NFTs are minted through smart contracts that manage ownership transferability without the need for an intermediary. NFTs can transform with traditional processes in real estate as we know them. So take your home, for instance. If we can tokenize that physical asset, we can then authenticate and verify the ownership of that asset on the blockchain so it's permanently recorded and nobody can change it or delete it. And then we can have smart contracts that automatically execute the financing, for instance, of that home without the need for an intermediary, which creates a much more transparent process for all parties involved. Okay, so Web3, crypto, and blockchain. I think we've covered those three. But where does the metaverse come into all this? Actually, I really have a meeting to run to, but I have the perfect person to connect you with. Noah at Parcel knows all about the metaverse, and I'm sure he'll be able to explain all this to you. I want to dig in a little bit more about the metaverse. What the metaverse isn't is what Facebook has rebranded itself to. In our minds at Parcel, that's what we would consider a closed metaverse not the open collaborative metaverse. To us, the metaverse is the next iteration of the internet. And this will be a more immersive way for people to enjoy experiences and services they typically do in a 2D web browser or, or mobile app today. But it's more than just a virtual space. The metaverse will encompass everything, all assets, digital assets and assets around the internet in one place. So how does Web3 play into the metaverse then? Web3 is the decentralized web, and we believe that the metaverse that we want to see in the future, we're gonna need it to be open, decentralized, interoperable in, in the sense that different virtual worlds can communicate and, and trade with each other, not closed metaverse like something that Facebook and other big tech companies are building. So virtual worlds, they seem to have existed for some time now. I think I probably have my Club Penguin login from 2007. Sure. And actually pretty recently, my little nephew showed me his house on Roblox. How is this different from the metaverse that you're talking about? The key distinction with the metaverse I'm talking about is ownership. Blockchain technology allows the users to also be the owners of these games and platforms and have true ownership of whether it's land or in-game items or buildings or wearables. So when we're talking about Web3, we talked a lot about community. How is that applied to what we were just talking about and the metaverse? In Web3, the community is everything. There is no metaverse without the community. In addition to the users being owners of these new virtual worlds, they also have say in governance, decision-making, how the game evolves. You know, not only are they owners of, of these assets, but they're the ones that are driving it forward into the future. So what are the platforms that Parcel currently supports in terms of virtual worlds? Yeah, so right now we're supporting six virtual worlds. Uh, some of the big ones are Decentraland and The Sandbox. So when I'm on Parcel and buying land, what am I actually getting? <laughs> when after you, the purchase is complete, an NFT will be transferred to your wallet and represents a specific parcel of land in one virtual world. How is the value of land determined across the different platforms you guys offer? Much like other assets, you know, the value of land is determined by supply and demand market forces. What we've seen makes land typically more valuable in the metaverse is very similar to the physical world. A parcel of land that's near water, landmarks, maybe near a celebrity, near a high foot traffic area is gonna be more valuable in, in the physical and the virtual world. Pretty famously now, somebody paid half a million dollars to, uh, to buy a parcel next to Snoop Dogg in the sandbox. So location still does matter even in the metaverse. All right, so you've sold me, I've set up my wallet, and now I've bought land in the metaverse. What are people actually doing with this land? You know, ultimately what people will do with their land is, is only capped by their imagination. A lot of the experiences we will spend time in the metaverse have yet to be invented yet. However, today, things we're seeing are people creating social spaces like concert venues, and there have been a number of very successful concerts in the metaverse already. People selling billboards to earn a passive income. So what we have seen is this emergence of Web3 creators, specifically, you know, 3D creators uh, coming into Web3, who are, you know, across the board, it's architects, artists, 
uh, fashion designers, interior designers. So this actually encouraged us to create a new product that we call Creatorverse, which is the creator directory for the metaverse. Artists can come show off their portfolio for their technical skills and ultimately get hired by a landowner to build something on their land.